this episode, I chat with Justina Blakeney, founder of The Jungalo. We talk about fearless creativity, relentless determination in social media growth, botanicals and design, and the Jungalo lifestyle. Welcome to the Flower Lounge, a place for conversations with wildly creative people and a little plant-loving wisdom to help you experience life in full bloom. I'm Katie Hess, flower alchemist and founder of Lotus Way. And I believe in a world where we're all living at our personal edge. So, thanks for having me here in your studio. My pleasure. Welcome. It's so beautiful. And I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about fearless creativity. Ooh, I like, there's your hashtag, fearless creativity. I love that. <laughs> Yeah, because I, I know that you've really worked hard, really hard, at creating exactly your life the way you want it to be. And you've made a lot of decisions creatively, I think, that are that could be considered as fearless. And I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, like, you know, what was designed before and now it's like plants and flowers and colors and beautiful wallpapers. And so have you felt, you know, when have you felt along the line in your in your business and what you've created, that you've had to use this quality of fearlessness or being fearlessly creative? I think that it's not necessarily something that I employ, but just sort of a character trait of mine. And I think ultimately it's probably rooted in like self-confidence. Mm -hmm. And I can probably thank my developmental psychologist parents for that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think they just always really nurtured my sense of self and an idea of exploration mm -hmm. and not necessarily to not hear criticism, but to hear yourself first and like how you feel about something mm -hmm. and then seek out how other feel people feel about it. Mm -hmm. And I think in doing things in that way, in that trajectory, you already know how you feel about it. And so you're not constantly seeking the approval of others. Right. You're already cool with it. And then if other people like it too, it's like an added bonus. Right. <laughs> so I think a lot of times with creatives, um, it's really what's holding people back is sort of this fear of you know, people not liking what they're doing or people thinking, oh, that's stupid or I don't like that or that's mm -hmm. ugly. But if you yourself in your heart kind of already love it, so what if other people don't? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's probably where where that comes from a little bit. I don't know. Mm -hmm. because, <laughs> from your love, because you just love yeah, it. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. I love it, and I think and I think it doesn't necessarily matter if other people love it or not. And mm -hmm. so there's nothing to fear, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the fearlessness comes from. I just like... It's okay if other people don't like it, if I like it. Mm -hmm. Like, we don't have to all like the same stuff. Right. And I, I realize if we should do that little exercise first. So, okay, so um, just take a second to close your eyes and go back to a time in your memory of when you were a child and you were playing around flowers or plants or trees. And see if you can identify a favorite flower something that pops out in your mind and if you could describe it in three words if, if this flower had a personality just think about how you would describe describe its personality in three words sweet delicate joyful okay and then open your eyes what did you think about plum blossoms Ooh. Yeah, we had plum trees in my backyard as a kid. And I think, I feel like that was my first experience of sort of watching the cycle mm -hmm. and also just sort of noticing how generous plants and flowers are. And they would give us these amazing plums and we would make jam. And we had this little, my sister and I would make jam and can it. And it was called Weeby Jammin'. <laughs> <laughs> so 80s. <laughs> Um, but we just would climb the trees and play on the trees and they provided shade and, and these amazing blossoms that like made our whole house smell so fragrant and wow. they were like bright pink and wow. it was just so joyful. Right. And, and so I think that was really my first experience of sort of realizing 
how much these trees gave to us, mm-hmm. you know, and the fruits and the flowers and the shade. And it was like this sort of ongoing all throughout the years, even when they weren't fruiting, right. they, they gave us, they gave us so much. And the three words you used to describe it were? I think sweet, sweet. delicate, and joyful. Because what we find is that typically those words that you would describe the childhood flower describe yourself or your own essence. Yeah, well. Or how you... <laughs> Thank you. Does it fit? Um, yeah. I feel like maybe the delicateness... I don't know. Maybe I am delicate in certain ways. I certainly am joyful. I have a lot to be grateful for. And yeah, I think I'm pretty sweet. I can be. <laughs> I can be a bitch, too. I can be sweet. <laughs> Cool. And how does how has nature inspired a lot of your work? Oh my gosh, definitely. I call nature my muse, which is a little bit ridiculous, but because it's like everything. But I just I really find that I don't know. I use this term sometimes, like arboreal vestiges. Like we have these arboreal vestiges, our ancestry, you know, as apes living in the trees and swinging from tree to tree and sort of being enveloped by nature, that's where we come from. Mm -hmm. And now, even though I live in a big city and I love living in big cities, I think there is a part of me and I believe in all of us that like longs for that living in the trees Mm -hmm. feeling and, and being in nature and, and that freshness and that sort of at one with nature thing Mm -hmm. that as humans, we've kind of lost Mm -hmm. a little bit. And so I think with my design work, I really try and bring in plants and flowers in all of their kind of manifestations. Mm -hmm. So I love to fill my home with actual plants and actual flowers, but I also like to create motifs that inspire sort of the way it might feel when we were living in the jungle or, you know, in the plains or wherever, you know, we lived as apes, <laughs> we were still apes, but you know, <laughs> as uh, as ancient apes, shall we say? And is that how the jungle came about? The name jungle because of all the plants in your house? Kind of. I was actually so the only apartment I've ever lived in by myself, and I had just moved to LA. This was about nine years ago, and I had some friends who were visiting. We were all sitting around and you know hanging out, eating, chilling, drinking wine, and I had this wallpaper up in my apartment that was banana leaf wallpaper from the Disney hotel in like 1976 in Miami. It was like these mammoth leaves and we were all getting a little bit tipsy and one of my girlfriends was like, this is the cutest bungalow I've ever seen. It's like a jungle. And then we were like, it's like a jungle. (laughs) And and that was like the moment where I was like, oh my God, that word is so fun. And at first we just used it like super, or I used it super casually, like just to describe my house. And then maybe like five years later, I was at a flea market and I ran into a guy who I had done some buying from, from a client like years before. And he was like, oh, you, you're that girl who has a blog, right? What's it called? Jungalo? And I was like, my, my blog wasn't called that at the time. You know, I was still going under like Justina Blakeney. It was like uh-huh. blog.justinablakeney.com. And I had branded everything under my name. I was like, people remembering me for that and that name is so, but nothing, I don't have anything with that name. So I just had this moment and then I rebranded everything like jungle, oh, jungle, oh, jungle, oh, jungle. And it's fun and memorable and there's something mm-hmm. bouncy about it, mm-hmm. like effervescent. And right. then it kind of encompasses the whole like, nature and plants and things like that that I am really, um, that I really love and that I'm becoming well known for. But I also think that for me, the jungle thing, it has to do with nature and it has to do with plants, but it has to do with kind of like more than that as well. It's sort of like the layers and the lushness and the freshness that comes from like thinking about like living in a jungle, you know, tropical flowers and tropical plants. I mean, like epiphytes, like the air plants, like the plants that just like grow off of trees and like, oh they're all so weird and cool. <laughs> like. And the secrets that sort of are hidden within right. the the forest and the jungles and stuff like we're every day still discovering all the powers. I'm sure you know a lot more oh about my God. that than I do. We but. just we we just came from the Naples Botanical Garden in South Florida, <gasps> and it's just I mean just like you're saying the the, the trees are just dripping with air plants and yeah. orchids and 
and there's this whole like wicked weird plant collector obsessiveness like they'll go into alligator laden waters to steal ghost orchids i mean it's just like what <laughs> i've seen documentaries like that it's yeah it's crazy and amazing and I, yeah so i just love that there's so much mystery and discovery mm -hmm. and i and i feel like Dec when decorating or when you're creating your, your world and your home, it's so cool to kind of bring in some of that mystery and some of that sense of wonder and sense of discovery. I mean, not to mention all the like actual sort of like health benefits that can come from being with plants and right. in the ritual of taking care of them, but also the air purification and, mm -hmm. and all of the sort of Real scientifically proven stuff that right, you right. Know, living with plants can increase the quality of life. Right, and there's such an element of fun to the name Jungalo. <laughs> I, I like how do you how do you how do you bring that fun element because you're you're doing something that you love, but at the same time I know you work really really hard. Yeah, I feel like I work long. I don't know how hard I work. Like. Sometimes I feel like the idea or sort of this concept of like working hard mm -hmm. makes it sound like drudgery. Drudge, yeah. yeah, but I love it. And like, I love being here and I love working with my team and I love, I, I love pretty much like I'd say 85% of what I do on the daily basis. So it doesn't really feel like work to me, mm -hmm. even though it's how I make my living. Um, and I think that's why the jungle is a fun place I think you can kind of feel that you can mm -hmm. kind of feel when someone's having fun with what they're doing from the other side and I think you can always tell with brands and with right. products and stuff like if the person behind it is having fun and is loving what they're doing I think that really translates into the products and into like the social channels and the mm -hmm. blogs and all that stuff it's it's palpable and on the same note you know, like, I think some people may look at, you know, a professional blogger and say, oh, well, you know, they just did some blog posts and put up pretty pictures and and then suddenly they got noticed and it was really breezy. And like, <laughs> I wondered if you could speak because that, that was one of the things that when I took one of your workshops that I was the most impressed about when you were talking about and if I didn't have this many readers by 11 o'clock at night and my goal was this, then I would do yeah. something. I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about you know, tracking and measuring and yeah. results and how that comes into the world of fun and creativity. Totally. So I think on top of being the kind of person that likes to have fun with what I do, I'm also fiercely ambitious and I set goals and I like to meet them and I definitely crave meeting those goals and, and getting my stuff to the next level. So that's also just like a part of my personality. I've always been like that. I think it, it, I think it was in high school that I had the realization and this I don't mean to sound cocky when I say this, but it's like, <laughs> um, you know, people were like, oh, just, you know, you're smart or you're talented or you're this and you're that. And I applied early decision to Yale and I really wanted to go to Yale. I wanted to go to their drama school and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, sure, I was going to get in was like straight A student, like a million extracurricular activities. And I applied and I didn't get in. <laughs> and it was such a good lesson for me because... First of all, it made me go a little down to earth from like this thing of like, oh, well, I can do whatever I want. And it was like all of a sudden I was like, oh, OK, <laughs> like rejection happens, failure happens. And but instead of sort of like dwelling in that, I just like it was a really good lesson. And what I took away from that is that being smart and being talented isn't enough. Like you have to work your ass off as well. Right. And and I had I had worked really hard, but you know what I'm saying? Like it was just that point where you're like, you know, you're good at English, so you can kind of like get an A in English, even if you're not really like asserting yourself to your maximum capacity or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so it was like from that moment, I realized that if I was really going to try and achieve my goals, I actually had to really work hard at it as well. So mm -hmm. like the people who are at the top are smart and talented and they work their asses off. And so that was just a really good lesson for me to learn at a good time to learn it, you know, right. like 17 and getting ready to like figure out what my life was going to really look like. So I do, I work my ass off and I, and I love it, but I, I think it's really important to like study things like statistics and statistics. <laughs> <laughs> and oftentimes, you know, just to be paying attention to 
rhythms or patterns that you see in your work because while ultimately it's most important to me that I love what's happening and I feel good about what I'm putting out, it's easier to uh, repeat success if you realize what the patterns are in what other people like as well. Mm -hmm. So a very simple example, a mundane example is that, so it was Easter a couple of days ago and I have this picture that I probably took like five years ago of these succulents in these egg cups. And I was like, oh, it's Easter. Like this picture always performs well. I'm going to post it to my jungle feed. And I got 15,000 likes. <laughs> it's like my number one most liked photo in all of history. It was like these little egg cups with like succulents in it. And it was funny because I, I knew that photo performed well. I had never posted it on the jungle feed, but it was like through sort of like studying all my images and knowing like what performs well at what times and what time of day to post it and this and that, that I'm continuously able to kind of like outperform myself. Mm -hmm. And so I get silly and competitive with myself. Like right now, my jungle Instagram feed is outperforming my just you know like Instagram <laughs> feed and I'm like oh no I can't outperform myself <laughs> like, I just like push myself to like go from, you know more right. and more and more to kind of grow the brand and and be able to continue to do what I love on a daily basis and hopefully make a little money along the way and be able to help inspire people and, and what keeps you on your creative edge so that to me sounds like that's like you're you're competing with yourself to keep a business edge going what keeps you on your creative edge how do you you know keep giving more juice to the things that are going to pull you further and further outside of the box i gave a talk recently and and one of the things that i talked about was indulging in moments of inspiration and i think that it's easy when you own a business and when you've got bills to pay and stuff like that, to not do that. So there are moments where I'm more inspired than other moments. And what I've learned to do is that when I'm in those moments of inspiration, when I feel like drawing, or when I feel like making a face the foliage, or when I feel like painting, like whatever it is that I feel like doing in that moment, mm -hmm. if I allow myself to break from what I'm actually working on, even if there's a deadline or something, and indulge myself in doing the painting or doing the drawing or doing the face the foliage projects, they come out way better and I'm faster. So when I try and force myself to do that stuff when I'm not in it, right. when my head's not in it, right. I find that it takes longer, the product doesn't come out quite as well. And so, yeah, I really try and allow myself to indulge in those moments, even if it's in the middle of the night. Or even if it's, you know, I, I <laughs> my husband like trips out sometimes because he'll wake up in the middle of the night and I won't be in bed and like I'll be in the other room like drawing or something like that because I can't sleep and I have this idea. And so when it's possible, I, I allow myself to do that even if I it means pushing a different deadline, you know, back a day or two mm -hmm. in order to really um, allow myself to explore in those moments where I feel inclined to do so. And what happens when you are working on a creative project, you've got a deadline and you're totally blocked. I try and just stop and work on something else. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it helps to like bounce ideas off of people in my team. And that's usually the first thing I'll do. And if that doesn't work or if I still feel blocked, I will, um, yeah, I'll stop and I'll work on something else for a little while and then I'll try and come back to it. Even if I'm working up against a deadline, I think most of the time people would rather me hand in something a day or two late and have it be awesome, then, you know, and that's come with age also. Like I used to be super deadline oriented. I still am like to a degree, but yeah, for the most part, if you've got a client or somebody who, you know, is expecting to receive something on a certain day, if you say like, this is going to get here, excuse me, this is going to get here a day late, but it's going to be like 10 times better than it would be if I gave it to you today. Mm -hmm. Nine out of 10 times, they're going to be like, okay, cool. Right. <laughs> and so I think it's really also just about keeping an open flow of communication with whoever it is that you're working with mm -hmm. so that they understand like what the process is, what's going on. They, you know, you're giving them heads up, all that. And for the most part, I find that, yeah, people are willing to wait for something mm -hmm. that's going to be worth the wait. Right. Yeah. And I remember finding you years ago and seeing the very first 
face, the foliage, you know, wasn't it like the leaf and the little beautiful like yeah. leaf lips and going, just being so captivated and the, the, they must have been the, some of the first ones you ever did. Yes. They were so yes. simple but so exquisite. Thank you. Can you just talk a little bit about the whole face, the foliage movement, how it came and what it's grown into? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the very first one that I ever made, we were, the, I no longer live at this house, we were at a different house over near downtown LA and there are these huge peppercorn trees. And just lots of like weird greenery everywhere. I, lots of trees, I don't even know what they were, but there was this particular, this peppercorn tree whose leaves were quite long and thin. And so they would like constantly rain down on our yard. So I spent a lot of time like sweeping them and just trying to clear the space when I cared or when I had time to do that. <laughs> so anyway, I just looked down at, at this one leaf in particular and I was just struck because the leaf like was in a perfect like lip shape and it, you know it had the line in between and it had the little whatever this thing is called right here <laughs> the little v uh -huh. i was like this leaf looks so much like like a like lips and so i just like kind of sat down for a second and i put it on my jeans and then i just like bent down and grabbed a few other leaves and i was like and these kind of look like eyes and then i had a peppercorn <laughs> you know it was a peppercorn tree so i grabbed the little ball of one of the peppercorn and like made eyeballs like snapped a picture with my even though Instagram was around. It was like, I was just, you know, still blogging and stuff. So I took a picture and like filed it away. And every now and again, I would just like make a face and just take a picture of it, maybe post it to the blog or something, just funny. And it was actually one of my really, really good friends, maybe a year or two after that, who was like, you know, I've seen a lot of your work and of all the stuff you've ever put out, I feel like those faces that you make with leaves are like the coolest thing you've ever done. And I was like, really? Huh, that's interesting. And so that night when I got home, I like collected some more of the leaves and I was like, I'm going to explore this idea a little bit more. And I just started playing. And that's when the whole thing kind of like researched. This was after Instagram and started and all that. And I took a picture on Instagram and people went like crazy, crazy. for it. So then I started really like digging in and, you know, going to the flower market and getting flowers and walking around my neighborhood and foraging you know, for, for different kinds of leaves. And I would keep a little Ziploc bag in my purse. <laughs> and, and once I kind of realized how much fun I was having with it, I sort of opened up the project and I was, I think sometimes you have to give permission to people to, to do stuff, even though it's not like I own making portraits with flowers, but people are so afraid of like copying or like, right. it's just a sensitive kind of thing these days with, right. with the internet and creativity and all that so I was just like everybody like do this <laughs> make portraits out of leaves and flowers it's like fun it's therapeutic it's super easy it's free you don't like need anything to do it right. and it's this ephemeral craft where it's like once it's it's almost like the buddhist like sand mandala right <laughs> yeah where it's like you you can spend like an hour making one of these or whatever and then when it's done you like compost your <laughs> your things or something you can do with like flowers that are about to die like that have been sitting in your house for a week or whatever so Anyway, I opened up the project once people felt like they had the permission to to sort of do this, face the foliage artists started blossoming all over all over the world. And and so we started the hashtag and yeah, it was just really, really fun. And then, you know, we started getting some good press and people just got were just sort of delighted by by this by this project and so kept it up for a while then as I tend to do maybe after a year and a half of this I kind of started doing other creative exercises and moved on to other projects but the face the foliage feed is now curated we started its own Instagram feed so it's now curated by some amazing foliage artists Sister Golden and they've done a great job of sort of just cultivating the community and continuing to have the community grow and flourish and hopefully we'll do more like face the foliage projects mm -hmm. you know as time goes on but I'm such a creative like schizophrenic <laughs> 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 that I'm just like working on a million different things at one time and I'm mm -hmm. you know but yeah that that was that that is the face the foliage project and it's still growing and it's still so fun to see all the creativity and all the fun people are having with it all over the world. Is there anything that really surprised you about that movement or that it became a movement <sighs> that so many people jumped on board so quickly? You know, I have to say not really. Mm -hmm. The first book I ever did was a book about how to cut up your t-shirts. And that was 
the most popular book of its kind and of its series because it was a four book series and it was the first one we came out with and it was super popular and everybody was like well yeah the book is really popular because everybody's got a t-shirt and so everybody's got a t-shirt in their drawer that like they don't care about and that they're like willing to cut up right and so I always remembered that like things that people already have in their houses that they sort of like things that are easily accessible you don't have to go out and get supplies for or whatever things that are free or super cheap like those are things that people it it, it spreads like wildfire it's like the cut up a (laughs) t-shirt like go outside and forage like five leaves <laughs> like anybody can do that any I hope like there's at least one tree on any block <laughs> that like you could you could just take some leaves from maybe some buds maybe a couple of sticks and make a foliage portrait and so I think just the sheer accessibility of the materials yeah. that it takes to do something like this makes it so easy for anybody to try and the only thing that's like blocking people from trying it is that fear you were talking about before so I think the only hmm. sort of thing that I've ever heard is people like oh well I don't think I could do it like I don't know I'm like oh you, you can like all you have to do is put a stick here a stick here a stick here and a leaf here and like you've done it <laughs> like then you can work on it and make it better but like anybody who's said that and it's been a lot of people I've like forced them to sit down and try and make one and then after they're like oh my god I made a face out of leaves <laughs> like I know it wasn't hard it wasn't hard no. so uh, you know sometimes it's just that 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 hurdle of like getting people like just pushing people like just outside their comfort zone but it really is a simple thing it's like as simple as like cutting out a pair of lips from like a magazine and a pair of eyes and you know it's the same right. general sort right. of collaging idea that a right. kindergartner has done and can do I mean right. I get emails from moms and showing me pictures you know face the foliage portraits that their kids are working on or Aww. you know things from schools all over the world like with development developmentally disabled folks who are making portraits with leaves and flowers you know what I mean so it's just this really cool thing because the materials are free and super accessible and anybody can do it right wow and and what's that been like having a daughter and also hustling in business and your creative life yeah that's probably the hardest thing for me just because I am so ambitious and I am so passionate about my work And I'm also so passionate about her Mm -hmm. that it's like a constant tug of war and I do my best to balance. And sometimes I think I do better than others, but in the last two years, I've also had to travel quite a bit. Yeah. So I had my book come out last year, the new Bohemians. And so we didn't do like a full on book tour, but it still took me around the country, both in the making of the book. And then once the book was released and it's just exhausting just because I try not to stay away for too many days at one time so Mm -hmm. oftentimes I'll like fly in on a red eye do whatever I need to do for that day and then fly home that night to be able to tuck her in you know and so it's just like I want to be there for those moments and I don't want to be missing out right um and whenever I'm feeling a little too hard on myself what I try and remember is that my mom worked full-time when I was growing up and I like never like if I like like search deep within myself I never felt like she wasn't around like I felt like she was always there and if ever I needed anything she was like right right there right so I kind of just try and remember that because she was like running a school (laughs) when I was growing up and you know had a, a lot of people depending on her and so many responsibilities and three kids and I always felt like she was there so I just try and remember that and not be too hard on myself about it mm-hmm and she has her dad, and he's a great dad. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. And so what are just some of the projects that you're really excited about that you're working on now? That you're... Oh, I feel like I'm excited about everything. I'm just excited about this trajectory that I'm on. And I, you know, I spent a long time as a graphic designer and an art director. And then I spent years decorating homes. And I loved both of those careers. And I loved doing that work. But... Um, I always felt like there was something missing and I was like always kind of reluctant to like tell people oh I'm a graphic designer or I'm an interior designer like I never felt like those titles sort of wholly encompassed even what I felt like I was doing Mm -hmm. but but also that that I wanted to be doing something slightly different and I didn't know exactly what that was so now I'm designing product 
know, I'm designing home furnishings, I'm designing print and pattern, um, and then doing some decor projects like associated with all the stuff that I'm designing, like these pillows and this wallpaper and just like stuff that's around. Mm-hmm. And I found this thing that sort of magically married my graphic design with my interior design backgrounds. And I never would have been able to discover that place if it weren't for the blog, because it's not like I, I would have known how to, or, or had the means to like create these product lines. It's come from building an audience and then, you know, having manufacturers and companies get interested in me because of the marketing power that I have and the audience that Mm -hmm. I built. So I came at it in such a weird way, but because of my graphic design background, you know, I know how to to make repeating patterns and I know how to like create the, do the branding around this company that I'm building. Right. And because of my interior design background, I know how to, you know, mix patterns and create a setting that feels a certain way and that kind of emits a certain feeling. And so this product design stuff is like my jammy jam jam. And I wasn't sure. (laughs) I didn't know that (laughs) until I started doing it. But now that I'm doing it, I mean, I'm designing furniture and I'm designing wallpapers, wallpaper, yeah, stationery, everything, like anything that clothing. Yeah. So it's, it's just like really, um, it's it's really fun and and I feel like my dreams are kind of coming true and I didn't even really know that that was what my dream was yeah. until I started doing it. And how long did that take until you just were, were like this is my jammy jam? I feel like that like just happened. <laughs> and so how many years in are you um, from from So I've been like a creative freelance type of person for I just turned 37, so 17 years, uh-huh. 16 years. Uh-huh. Yeah. So it just wow. happened, I think maybe last year, wow. where I finally felt like, okay, this is like the right, this is my thing. You're yeah. taking yeah. it. Yeah, and who knows, maybe in five years from now, things will have moved in like some other direction. Uh-huh. I think that's the nature of the creative workplace today is that right. we have to be agile and flexible and kind of be able to roll with the punches and just go go with the flow right mm-hmm. but right now i'm so grateful to sort of be able to be designing product be sharing sort of daily inspirations through the design blog and it really does marry all of my creative interests from making art doing photography writing styling collaging like all the stuff that Everything. i like to do um i'm constantly utilizing all those skills and moving back and forth. Yeah, I think a lot of people would say that you are, you are, I mean, in the design world, you are a pioneer, you're a change maker, you have created your own set of rules, and have there been any challenges along the way in terms of doing that, and if so, how did you maneuver around them or through them? That's a good question. I feel like things have gone pretty smoothly. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, no, there's always setbacks. Um, I think also working with large companies is often challenging. There's lots of hurdles to jump through, and sometimes your creative vision can get a little bit watered down, and that's sometimes hard to swallow. And what I try and do, for the most part, is whenever I do face challenges, to sort of nip them in the butt, don't dwell on them, don't wallow in my (laughs) challenges sort of like when I didn't get into Yale like the next day I was working on my applications for the other things it's like okay that didn't work out fine next move that on you know move that I feel like a lot of people like really get stuck get stuck in that failure and like swim around in it and take a jacuzzi (laughs) and do what they need to do in that failure for like a long time and I think that's particular to creative people a lot because it's so personal but I try not to just take that stuff too personally and I mean it's hard sometimes you know and and you know being in the public eye or you know having a large audience you do face criticism and you do face people you know telling you that the book you just wrote people should save their money for a haircut or (laughs) whatever they're gonna say Well, you just, yeah, I mean, just remember that a year later you'll be able to laugh about it, you know, and uh, that ultimately (laughs) it's just like one person's opinion and not to, not to stick around and wallow in your, in your failures. 
Right. I have a couple of really quick questions. I wanted to yeah. just like one or the other in terms of you. Beach or forest? Forest on a beach. <laughs> Bad in like Sweden and stuff, right? Right. <laughs> chocolate mousse or fruit sorbet? Oh, chocolate mousse. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorbet's too sweet. Pen <gasps> pencil or pen? Or? Oh. Or you can. I guess pen. Okay. Sunrise or sunset? Sunrise. Cats or dogs? Dogs. <laughs> Sorry, Luna. I have a cat and I don't have a dog. <laughs> Introvert or extrovert? Extro. And spring, summer, fall, or winter? Spring. Spring. And what's a song that you're really grooving on right now? Any song. Some... Ordinary People. Ordinary People. John Legend. Love me some. I love you, John. <laughs> <laughs> And what are you super grateful for right now? A long list, not a short fire question. Or three things, the yeah. top three things. That top three things, well, my daughter, um, my health and the health of my family. And on the heels of that, I'll say my grandmother's, who I'm very close to, she's old and she's ill. And I'm feeling so grateful that my whole family lives in LA and that were able to hang out with her and see her and visit her and then my daughter is able to know her oh. and hopefully I think will remember her it's really important to me she's named after my great-grandmother oh wow and so I love that she's gonna remember her great-grandmother the way I remember mine wow and what kind of rituals do you what kind of rituals are important to you whether it's self-care or a sense of you know meaning or profound so I grew up, my mom, my, I grew up Jewish, my mom is Jewish, mm -hmm. and we did a Shabbat dinner every Friday night. And we always had like family dinners, but I sort of loved this idea of having like community dinners and, and doing that and family dinners and mm -hmm. talking about your day and sitting together and eating and being focused on eating together. Mm -hmm. And so that's a ritual the eating dinner together part of it that I'm carrying on with my family that I think is is really important to me. I think I have a lot of creative rituals that I that I do. I try and do at least one thing with my hands every day because I spend um, a lot of time on the computer. Right. So even if it's just like five or ten minutes, I like to do like hand drawings, hand sketches, watercolors. I have like over there, I have like a big bag of clay that I keep under my desk. Sometimes I do little, I'll make like a stupid little pot or, you know, it's like very stupid. I can show this to you. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I think it's important to, to not like spend your whole day on the computer and to, you know, sometimes, and I think this is why Instagram has been such a, a great tool for me because sometimes I'll break just to like create a, a little scene for Instagram or something like that. And then it, it can just like, just take me out of my like Gmail universe, <laughs> you know, for a few minutes. And even if it's seriously just five or 10 minutes, I think doing that kind of stuff and getting a little bit analog is super important so so that's a kind of a daily ritual thing that I wow. do I also go about twice a month maybe once once or twice a month I go to a Korean spa Yay, it's my favorite yeah. we so we get all nakies I oftentimes bring my daughter and so perfect we'll go and we scrub each other down and it's like the only time she'll let me brush her hair <laughs> <laughs> and you know if I'm there without her I'll get like a scrub that's my probably my number one like mm. self care thing that I do. As you can tell, I haven't had a manicure. In a long time. <laughs> <laughs> the spa thing is kind of uh, is the one thing I definitely try and keep up with. So like rejuvenating. I also love jacuzzis. I'm trying to convince my my Jason to to let me have a jacuzzi. Right now. <laughs> like I think water is so healing. It is. And like the hot waters and I just I love it. So, so meditative. Especially when it can be outdoors. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the jacuzzi thing's gonna happen. Twenty seventeen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sounds good. 
So what do you use as your internal compass in terms of when you, so you probably get bombarded with projects and people wanting different things from you. So you have to, I know you have a really strong sense of no, that's not something I want to do now, or yes, that's something I want to do. And you follow that. <laughs> like you learned that right? from personal experience. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> but I mean, yeah. I, I remember from, you know, how, how long ago was it when, also when you were saying, you like to create this business because you can do a little bit of this and you can do a little yes. bit of that and you don't feel like doing that, now you can do this. How do you make those decisions and how, what's the inner compass for, how, when you're really deeply listening? Mm -hmm. So I like to think about things very long term. So I think people are often like surprised to, to hear that like I think about my business and what it will look like and what I want to be doing and like, 10 or 15 years from now. Right. And so on a daily basis, when I'm responding to emails or trying to decide which projects I want to do, I don't just think about what it's going to look like for my life right now. Mm -hmm. I think about what it's going to look like for my life in like five or 10 years. Right. And in doing that, it makes it a lot easier to decide which things to stress out about, which things to not stress out about. It like puts things in perspective a little bit because like, for example, my furniture line that's coming out next month. Like when that first happened, I was like, these are chairs that somebody could potentially have in their house like 10 years from now. This is something oh, that I wanted. There's like all of a sudden it's just like, yes, 10 years. It sounds like a lot, but ultimately in like the grand scheme of things, it's going to come up really quickly. <laughs> that was 27, 10 years ago. It doesn't sound, it wasn't that far ago. <laughs> like it wasn't that long ago. Right. So, so yeah, I, I, I actually evaluate like all the, you know, projects that I take on and what I'm going to do with that in mind. And sometimes I'll take something on that might not have repercussions of, of that. If it's something that I feel like a is not going to take up too much of my time or mental energy mm -hmm. or B is for a friend or someone I care about or someone right. I admire or something like that. So there's always exceptions to that. But I think in general, I refer to it in my like speaker speak as like my North star. I'm thinking about like what my North star is and I try and keep that in mind. Mm -hmm like all the time and once you have like a very clear picture of what that north star looks like for you it starts to be easier to evaluate each decision each project because you are working towards a specific goal and when you say north star is that literally in your mind a visualization of how life is 10 to 15 years yeah, from now exactly mm -hmm. exactly so everything from what my business looks like to what my house looks like to what my family looks like and so it's just a lot easier to manifest things when you're really clear about it. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people have a hard time as creative sort of picturing that or thinking big enough to be, you know, I want my book to be a New York Times bestseller or I want that, like, you have to be able to, like, visualize it and say it out loud. And then it's, like, so much easier to make it happen and to manifest it. Right. People are, like, afraid to say, I think maybe that's also specific to women like women sometimes have a really hard time like owning like big goals mm -hmm. I'm not a Hillary supporter but <laughs> I do think that it's nice for for young girls and for women to see somebody like that mm -hmm. who's sort of reaching these these crazy goals just because as women we don't often grow up with those kinds of with those kinds of role models role and, models yeah right. go Bernie <laughs> And terrible person. <laughs> and and, and who have been your role models? Anybody? Who have been my role models? Uh, well, my mom, for one. I mean, mm -hmm. she's just, I think what I spoke about a little bit earlier, um, she's just sort of like this master juggler. And it it's just been so amazing for me to grow up with someone who has had a really successful and such a full career, but also is constantly taking great care of everyone around her mm. and so I it just it's just sort of amazing to me it's like this magical thing so my mom has definitely been a role model for me I think I have people who I look up to sort of in the creative world for what they've been able to build and for how they've sort of modeled their businesses mm -hmm. um, I often talk about Jonathan Adler um, because he's like a potter and makes pots but like he also like designs boutique hotels and now has like you know furniture lines everywhere and has also a very specific style that's very noteworthy and happy and sort of from a branding perspective, I think he's done a really exceptional job of 
having a really like wide array of things that he's good at and things that he does, but mm -hmm. he's like pulled it together so beautifully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I could go on. Like, there's definitely a lot of people who I admire. I mean, I love Frida Kahlo and every sort of sort of her sensibility and her style mm -hmm. and, and her the way she emotes through her work. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, she is. I mean, the legacy that she left and 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 you know didn't even know that she left. Yeah, is just exactly. Mind blowing. So, last question, and that is, if you're th in terms of legacy, when you think about you know, 10, 15, 20, 30. Is there anything that is really important to you in terms of impacting other people or a legacy that you want to leave behind as a result of you or your work? Yeah, I think there is. And I, I don't think, I don't know if I've ever sort of expressed this out loud, but our little like byline for the Jungalo is feel free, have fun and decorate wild. And I think one of the things that I'm trying to do and what I'm hopefully succeeding at is giving people permission to like have fun in their homes and like use mm -hmm. design and decor as a place, as a way to make their lives more fun and more free and more happy. And I feel like design can be so stuffy and so impersonal and mm -hmm. like with so many rules and people are like, oh, what are the top 10 rules of like this or that? And it's <laughs> oh, mixing color, mixing pattern. Like, and it's just like not that serious. <laughs> it's really not. And I think if your home is working for you and if you get home and you're like, I love where I live and this is so fun and this is colorful, like that means you're doing it right. Right. And so as far as like, um, as far as my legacy goes, if I'm inspiring people to make a home for themselves that makes them feel like their best selves and their mm -hmm. happiest selves and their sort of fullest selves and in a place where they feel like they can raise their children and their children can have fun and feel free and decorate wild, <laughs> then I feel like I'm, I'm doing my job. And I think sometimes as designers and working on product and stuff like that, it's easy to feel like it's kind of frivolous and it's mm. just about stuff and all that. And what I've actually learned about what I do because I love it and I don't want to do something else just because this is frivolous is that I'm, I'm bringing a lot of joy into a lot of people's lives. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't tell you how many comments I've gotten and emails I've gotten just about people who are like, you know, well, after I read your book, you know, I realized that other people decorate like me too. And that it's okay to like have lots of stuff and it's okay to be surrounded by a million plants or just like giving people permission to, to like, be to be themselves, right. you know, and telling them that like, it's okay to decorate like that. And that a lot of people love it and think it's beautiful. And, and it doesn't have to be this certain way that these bloggers say it needs to be, or that that magazine says it needs to be. So yeah, giving people permission to just exhibit who they are in their homes. That's profound. Yeah, Thanks. that's not frivolous <laughs> at all. <laughs> yeah. So that's hopefully what people are getting. Thank you so from much. From my channels. Thank you so much. I'm excited for you. Is there anything else I should be asking you? Or anything else you want to plug? No. Or just like, I think go here, buy this, do it. Like, no, I'm just excited for you and your book and question. all your stuff that you're doing. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for listening to The Flower Lounge. I'm Katie Hess, and we'll be releasing a new podcast every Wednesday. If you like what you heard or you know someone who might be touched by our conversation, share it with them. And don't forget to subscribe. To find out what your favorite flowers mean about you, take the quiz at lotusway.com.